Hi everyone, happy Pride Month. I hope you're all doing well. My name is Sabrina Skinner and I'm going to be reading my paper over LGBTQIA history, the visuality of gender and sexuality through art in Renaissance Venice. The painting Bacchus and Ariadne by Venetian Renaissance painter Tiziano Vecilio or Titian is demonstrative of both the fascination surrounding classical art and culture during the Renaissance as well as the underlying characteristics of Venetian society specifically in relation to the effects of the plague and religious reform on its social and economic environment, of which especially contributed to the city's wealth and far more relaxed relation to Christianity than that of Rome. This is depicted through the casual celebration of classical inspired figures and the greater attention paid to the engagement of the female and male subjects within the painting. Many details conveyed through the piece can be connected to the societal structure of Venice during the time in which Titian lived. It is possible that certain personal predilections which the artist may have had would have subconsciously or even intentionally been included with the finer points of the work, either as a form of self-reflection or otherwise as a form of secret visual communication, the later having recurred underneath the surveillance of censors which had begun to restrict the relative freedom of sexuality and gender within Venice during the, la the late Renaissance due to the evolution of reformatory practices within and outside the Catholic Church. So while this was more common to affect strictly biblical depictions due to the fear of blasphemy or oppositional encouragement of sin in context of religious officials or patrons themselves, the wealth of the patron involved with commissioning of this and other pieces of the series. Thus, the final product of the piece most likely conveys apparent details which were intended to and even encouraged by the audience which would have viewed it. The knowledge and involvement of the artist suggests that they too were accustomed to such environments as well. Analysis of the symbolism, social references of the time, and the contextual details of the classical tale within the painting can be seen as relative to the interconnected themes of gender, business, and sexuality during the era and relative geography of Renaissance Venice this being due to the distance between the city of Venice and the center of the papacy's pope power in Rome, excuse me, as well as the city of Venice's location as a major nexus of trade due to its advantageous seaport location, less constrictive regulations on prostitution and other profitable industries, and exuberant celebratory practices which centered around elaborate social gatherings. These factors resulted in an abundance of cultural and revenue-based forms of diversity within the living and visiting populations of Venice. These diversions of social policies distinguished this area from other city-states of the time, but would also place the city as a target for the more radical extremists of the Reformation vying for restoration of what they considered proper values, the likes of which did not necessarily involve art displaying ancient Greco-Roman idols or their ideals. While these, loose, while these looser morals and governmental policies would benefit the overall outer appearance of the city of Venice, these qualities were not necessarily openly accepted in and outside the city itself. As while its outward appearance reflects a society where Cortesians, performers, low-class artisans, and foreign traders found that they could make profit, it was also a time of great class, gender, race, and sexual disparity, wherein outcasts were also commonly targeted for their differences or otherwise judged for the services they provided. While some individuals were able to climb beyond the social restraints they were born into through learned trades, such as the artistry, sex work, and labor, many more would remain under the veil of Venice's wealth, such which is also alluded to within the majority of Titian's classically influenced paintings through the visualization of minorities in power. It is in this manner that Titian and many other Venetian artists' works differ from the more biblically focused characters and themes within Roman Renaissance art, and as such can be expressive of Titian's perception of his own circumstances within Venice's environment and history, that which had undergone great evolutions of politics, religion, and artistic expression since his classical origin. This is especially true of those commissions included in the series of Bacchanals, which, as seen within the painting of Bacchus and Ariadne, as well as many of his other pieces, scenes which depict circumstances of classical lore wherein a woman has been wronged and through whose will another outcome can be achieved where in Titian's depiction of Diana and Akaton, the uninvited violative male gaze is punished by turning the literal ravishment back onto the voyeur. 
Then in the Feast of the Gods, Titian recounts the near violation of Vesta by Priapus, if he had not been stalled and been revealed to others of the party by the bray of a donkey. Finally, in Bacchus and Ariadne, the princess has been abandoned by Theseus as she slept, betrayed by her lover only to awaken and find new love in Bacchus. Each of these pieces are illustrative of some cultural atmosphere of Venice, but are instead shown within the context of classical mythology, rather than being more reliant upon occasionally feigned Christian thematics. Titian instead focused on these effectiveness of storytelling through emotion, image, and basic human morals within the piece, through the subject of women's power in relation to the world. In further examination of Venetian painting, Bacchus and Ariadne, the tip, Titian depicts a scene of classical mythology wherein its subjects, human and creature, adult and child alike, express emotion and movement. This can be found in the physical displayments of Ariadne's shock and interest, Bacchus's enrapturement, or the party's enticement and jubilation, as well as the more simplistic representations of dram dramatism found within the figure's flowing drapery of cloth, writhing snakes, twisting vines, and billowing clouds. Together with great attention given by the author, sorry, by the artist in regards to the details of their physical features, the objects, and nature scenes around them. There is created a sense of classical dramatism which duly honors the painting's contextual inspiration. Similarly, in their placements and actions within the piece, there are illustrations of their own contents as of the purposes within the painting itself and their reactions to one another. In this manner, Titian is able to capture the energetic diverse and closeness which one can observe within the Venetian community at the time of the piece's conception itself. The use of color, pigmentation, and value within the painting is equally as demonstrative of the qualities of vibrant life and interaction, wherein relative loose concepts of nature are achieved so as to better represent the scene's energy, such as shown by the blurry, muddled nature of the background city. This illustrates the relevance of both the character's final narrative and the viewer's perceptions of the subject's importance within the space of the image thereby relating to the symbolic details of color, social references of time, and the manner of storytelling evident within Titian's style. That which is exemplified by the depth of space within the scene and the manner of contrast between the left and right sides of the piece which conducts the viewer's attention as intended. In relation to the subtextual details of the piece, Ariadne's robes are depicted in blue, white, and red, while Bacchus is gowned in a softer, more natural pink. Each of these artistic choices are likely symbolic wherein the pigments used were each expensive. This being due to the value of materials used in their fabrication, likely lead for white, lazurite, lapis lazuli for blue, and red matter, ochre, for the warmer tones. As such, the red and blues were often utilized to symbolically represent the wealth or importance of the subject, wherein blue commonly meant tranquility and white was indicative of purity while red was seen to signify intensity of emotion, such as love, passion, or anger, and even humanity in its relation to blood. In Bacchus's dressings, we see a light pink. This can be interpreted in its literal context of the combination of red and white, wherein pink can represent tenderness or calm or love. Another interpretation can be the influence of vibrancy on the piece of immortality, and likewise to the other figure, as seen by Ariadne's shell of white, the influence of peace on humanity's finite life. The blue at the background of the scene can likely be related to the life of wealth which she had left behind or otherwise been deprived of. Its stark emptiness a contrast the liveliness of the far corner of the painting depicting Bacchus's companions, whose illustration is far more detailed in regards to the diversity of darker colors and tones, where the greens and earthy browns can be understood as both symbolic of life in regards to nature and health, as well as simplicity. The uses of orange and white yellow are also in of symbolic intentions by the artist, as seen within the clothing of the other mythical figures, while yellow is especially relative to Venetian society in particular. In this manner, orange was a color implying commonness or middle-class status, those who at the time would attempt to emulate the upper class's richer dyed clothing with less expensive russet tones. White once more implies purity, suggesting a more diverse meaning than the simple biblical connotations of classical figures. While well, furthermore, yellow was commonly associated with joy, but also prostitution. As in Venetian society, such establishments as brothels were legal, and at times even encouraged by the church to discourage worse or sins. The establishment was also governed by women as a private means of income, but were held to governmental restrictions. 
such can be found in the laws put in place which required sex workers to wear a yellow scarf, among other garments, to notify others of their occupation. This overload of differing symbolic references could be indicative of Ariadne's life after making Bacchus, as in comparison to her past. This comparison outlining common conceptions of purity and sin, or otherwise what Venetian society might interpret as such. These matters of implications may also have been born from the artist's own purposes, as such businesses and persons as artisans, outside the view of the church, were often patroned and valued by their communities, whether as environments for women, an outcast to find enterprise, or as evidence of sexual freedom within Venetian Roman Renaissance communities, in which case Titian may have been part of these communities, been patroned by them, or otherwise somehow invested in displaying the subjects of gender and sexuality in a less restrictive manner than the ways of the church. Yet these intricacies of intentional use of color and structural detail can also serve to further exemplify the elements of contrast within the painting. Where the lighter tones of the sky pair well against the darker, earthier tones of the party's celebration, while the brighter, more vibrant shades of cloth set the figures forward in the image, away from the sky. Continuing in this manner, the image further emphasizes contrast between the left and right of the painting, wherein the left of the piece is calmer due to the simplicity of having one form, while the right is crowded with visual information and therefore heavier in tone as well as light and texture. This is shown through the left's general softness of pigment and visual texture of Ariadne's skin, the sky, and clouds. That which, when shown against the rougher and extravagantly detailed yet muddied nature of the darker right side of the canvas, creates an imbalance of scale. An idea which can be taken quite literally if one imagines a physical scale within the painting where Bacchus rests in the middle. With stylistic qualities from each side, humanity and nature, clarity and detail evident within his appearance. This figure of Bacchus is also expressive of the complexity and perhaps fluidity of Venetian society in regards to both gender and sexuality as represented within the human form, wherein modern perceptions can be seen within differing conceptions of masculinity, androgyny, and femininity, or godliness, which are depicted through an evolution from one side to the other within the painting, where on the left, with Ariadne, there can be interpreted to be the form of the divine feminine, as well as civilization and humanity, while on the right is the majesty of nature, the magic or immortality of the gods and mythical creatures, and the divine masculine, wherein details of both are displayed through the exaggerated forms of their character, whether in terms of virility, sexuality, or jubilation, the last being shown through the emphasis of wine, sport, and hunting. Yet in between these two opposites, there is depicted Bacchus, the concept of which forms a bridge between these two worlds with aspects of characteristics from either side displayed within his own appearance and energy. While this painting depicts a form of divine celebration and communion or love between Bacchus, a god, and Ariadne, a human, it can be also understood within the contextual circumstances of her side of the story of Theseus and the Minotaur wherein the Cretan princess Ariadne went away with Theseus the hero who had just previously defeated the half-god and half-human Minotaur, when, thereafter, the hero which she had provided aid and love to abandons her after one night. Leaving her in the wilderness of the island of Nexos, Ariadne goes from a princess to nothing, only to be greeted soon after after Bacchus and the rest of his troop in the midst of revelry. The god is said to immediately fall for the human, and it is this final scene which is depicted in Titian's work. This process of narration culminates in one painting, and would have been interpreted during the time based on a cultural understanding centered around the mythological framework in which their communities had once functioned other, wherein through their shared fascination of art, classicism, and self-representation, this depiction of a once religion shown to have evolved into a means in which the artist and the viewer alike might have found social connection through shared preferences during the relative freedom of the Renaissance, whether that be through the general notion of education and entertainment or as attempts at relating through identity and sexuality in ways which had once been relatively less stigmatized in greco roman world. Such is shown by early classical art, which later artists would attempt to emulate. This connection relates the piece not only to the Venetian Renaissance's turbulent society, but to the city's roots and antiquity. It was oftentimes persons of differing genders or sexualities within these communities who would seek to reflect upon and preserve the arts and histories of the past. 
influenced as they were by shared passion for heritage, as well as attempting to revive aspects of that culture, which had almost been lost to persecution, similar to the effects of prejudice they felt by those during the Renaissance. These shared experiences, while oftentimes negative, also provided a sense of unity and a means of control in which those displaced by social stigmas could find work, families, and a sense of community in an environment of safeness where through the arts, sciences are more bodily-based means of interaction. There involved forms of communication in Venice, especially which allowed greater freedoms and liberty, of which benefited both the cities and the city itself. Here are my cited works. Thank you, and I hope you all do well. <laughs>